Well, turn to Acts 20 tonight. Um, I, I will. I, I, am, I am a merciful man. You guys know that, don't you? And as much as I'm raring to go, um, I, we're just going to cover a few things here and uh, get us to where next week we'll, we'll, uh, we'll start dealing with the pastor's conference that Paul has on Miletus and um, <clears throat> with, with the pastors from Ephesus. And, uh, but we wanna, I want to I wanna close up a few things here and get, as we get going. Let's go ahead and go to verse 7 of Acts 20. I do want to remind you of a few things here because I, I think sometimes when we're going through books like this, um, you, you can start settling yourself in on the fact that we are, um, that we're just covering a book, that we're covering historical events and we're just going through the historical events and, and this is what the early church was and this is what they did and this is what happened. And, but we got to remember, and I, I think I've reminded us several times recently of this, we got to remember why the Holy Spirit started us through Acts is because he said it's time for the greater. If you remember that back about seven years ago, uh, that it's time for the greater. It's time for us to step into the greater. And and uh, and when he when he went into heaven, he said, "Man, th- this is your turn. It's time for you guys to step into the greater. I'm going to do you with power. Um, you're going to go. Uh, uh, you're going to take the word and and uh, I'll end- He said, uh, "But the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and you and you'll be filled with power." Um, to Samaria and Jerusalem. God, I just messed it up and now I'm too far away to go. But, but you're going to go everywhere to the uttermost parts of the earth and spread the, the power of God. Um, and so he said, it's time for you to do the greater works. John, he tells them. And again, John would have been in the uh, upper room. And he says, the things that I do, you'll do and greater things you'll do because I go to my father. And so the Acts is about the church stepping into the greater. Well, instead of us building on what the early church did, the church world as a whole has become a club, has become a club that we that we have rules on. You know, every club has their rules, um, and, and and our rules are called the Ten Commandments, and so we have to follow the rules. And then and then and then most most uh, clubs didn't like the ten original commandments, so they added a bunch of other ones to it about the length of your hair and the and and the ladies wear dresses and men have to wear this. Uh, we, we 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 saw a video uh, we saw a video this week where uh, where a guy was saying he, he was preaching like he was like he was. Um, going off the railing. I mean, just like, whoa, excited. And talking about purity and, and <clears throat> the anointing. And he was like, you, you can't have no anointing if you got a beard. And I said, hold it. <laughs> did he say beer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said, did he say beer? Because I know he didn't say beard. And he said beard. And he had, he had a, he had a, I don't know how many people were in that sanctuary, but it was loud and they were all going, yeah. Yeah, you know, you can't wear beards, and if you and I was like, what? and anyway, um, so, so that's what the church. I mean, and honestly, I, I'm not saying that the church is just that that we're uh, anti beards. Um, I, I, I'm saying that we've we've gotten so far off course instead of instead of increasing, and it, where would the church be? If we would have keep would have we'd have kept the hunger for the greater that the early church stepped into, and we'd have never stopped that. We we would be living in he- days of heaven on earth. That's the will of the Father, is as His will in heaven as it is on earth as it is in heaven. But we, we've allowed so many other things to creep in, and, to, and and all these rules to creep in, and and all these. The culture to to creep in, and then we can't figure out why things why we're not living in the greater. We question the authority of the Word of God because the authority of the Word of God says by His stripes we are healed, and yet we don't see a lot of people healed. And we're trying to figure out why that doesn't happen. It's because we allowed all these other things to creep in and and take the place of of Him. We've allowed other things to become more important than him. But God wants us, God said, man, he said, man, it's time. And again, if you remember back in, 
In 2015, when I preached that sermon in January, it wasn't a matter that he, he was saying, okay, I've opened the door for the greater. He, he just, he was saying to us, my goodness, folks, it's time. Will you quit letting other things distract you from the greater? It's time for us to step into the greater. Now, now again, that's seven years ago. And I think in some areas we've, we've enjoyed greater in some areas uh, we're still working through it. But my question is, is that uh, th- my, my point is, is that w- this in Acts needs to stir us up for the greater. If this is what they were doing back then, if they were growing in their church by a thousand a day, at least a thousand a day, then, then w- why, why are we not? We need to have a hunger for increase. We need to have a hunger for more than enough. We do not serve the God of just enough. There is nowhere in Scripture that God is identified as just enough or not enough. His very identifying name is El Shaddai, the God of more than enough, the God who supplies all our needs in abundance to the full until it overflows. That's who he is. And so we've got to get ourselves back in, in that position, in that line. We've got to, what, what did they do? What did the early church do that brought them to that place of the greater? But here's the thing with the word of God. I was listening on Sunday morning on our trip up here. Um, I, we, we left early and I, I listened to f- three and a half sermons. And, and two of them were just about, uh, we're, we're talking about the God of more than enough. And, um, and he started by saying, one of the things he was saying is that, um, well, I listened to three sermons and I was going to preach one of them here for a second. <clears throat> he, he, he was talking about the God of more than enough, but, but he, eh, I need to get back to where I was, uh, get, go back in. We've got, <laughs> I hate when I do that, but um, but we, we've got to get raise our expectations for uh, for the God of more than enough. We've got to we've got to raise our expectations for increase, not for just existing the way it's always been. Amen. So so that's what. Oh 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 oh. This is what he was saying. He said that the, he said that Barna, the research group had found that the, the way churches continue to grow or increase is by redefining themselves every 10 years. In other words, the, the, the culture kind of redefines itself every 10 years. And so the church needs to redefine itself to make itself uh, acceptable to the culture. And, and uh, this, the guy that was preaching said, I used to operate in that mentality where, you know, every 10 years we'd think, okay, we need to renew things. We need to refresh things. We need to do this. We need to, and, and he said, he said, the Holy Spirit said, that ain't, that ain't the answer. He said, the answer is your faith. And so my point is this, is that we're looking at the early church and we're going, Pastor Thad, that's the early church. That's 2,000 years ago. That, how does that apply to us now? We're living, we're living in the year of 2000 and, 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 we're, and, we're, and we, we, we know so much more and, and, and there's so much more going on. And I'm telling you this, <clears throat> that the same things that worked for the early church will work for us if we'll put it to work. Amen. I pulled that one out. But that's, but that's where I, I wanted to go is that we don't need to redefine. We just need to find out how it worked in the, old, in the New Testament or in the early church. And we need to, and we need to put it to work today. And, and so that's, that's, that's when I'm going in here and we're dealing here with Eutychus, um, th- that's kind of my mentality is, is that <laughs> the, the, the importance of, excuse me, takes a second to turn off and a second to turn on, and I missed the turn off. Um, we, we need to find out here what, 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 what God's pointing out to us. Okay, that, that's, that's why we go so slow. And I know some people are going, you go so slow because you talk a lot. And I know I, I get that part too. But, but, but we got to find out what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. And so here in the story of Eutychus, let's read it. 
And, and, and we'll, we'll start from there. Verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now this is a Troas. And there were many lights in the upper chamber uh, where they were gathered together. I've tried to figure out why they put that there. And I have no idea why that verse is there. The only thing I can think of, two, two prong. First of all, it was dark outside and it was really late at night. So it wasn't just kind of some illusion of time where it was, it was late, it was late, and there was lights. But I also believe that it's, it's in the middle of the desert over there in, in Israel, uh, in, uh, in Troas. So it's in the middle of the desert, middle of a dry, warm area. And the only way you could light up a room would be by fire, candles, lanterns. You, not, not, by, not by just turning on the lights. It would have, been, it would have added to the heat. I remember when I was, uh, my, my <clears throat> I think it was my year that I came home between my freshman and sophomore year of, of college, I believe. I, I got a job for a satellite company. Now, that sounds a whole lot better than it really was because satellite was the name of an, a porta potty company. And my job was driving one of the trucks and dri driving to, I was going to go, you know, suck it off, suck all the poopy out of there and all that stuff. <clears throat> Sorry, I, that would not be language. That, I, I, that's what I do, man. I'd fill it back up and go on. And uh, and one night, my Thursday runs were were the furthest away from town. What I would do is I'd drive about an hour and a half to two hours away from our uh, <laughs> from our uh, base in in Peoria, and and uh, then I would start my route. So it was just a two hour drive. And then, and what it was is that I would have to go through this power plant that had like 70 or 80 porta potties in it. And I would, and I'd, so I'd go. And what I had to do, because the tank on my back only, uh, on the back of my truck, only uh, took care of about half of them. So I'd have to, you know, suck them out, clean them out, and all that kind of stuff. And then I'd have to drive to find a place to dump it, which is, I didn't have to find a place. It wasn't like I was look, going, going down the road going, hmm, this guy looks like a jerk. I'm going to put it in his front yard. No, I just had to go and there was a place to dump it, a uh, sewage place, I guess. And I'd drive up there and I'd dump it. And, and then I'd have to drive back and finish it. And so I'd get done a little earlier because I would leave early. Um, but, but it was a long day. It was a long day. And, and one day it was one of those days I, we have them. I think tomorrow is supposed to be kind of a, a, a little cooler of a day, um, in, in here in Illinois, it was nothing for you to have a summer day, uh, where it was kind of rainy and drizzly and cool. Like I mean, low seventies, high sixties, just cooler. And, and it was kind of like really, it was nice out, you know, especially if you're out there working, doing all that stuff. And I never mind working in the rain anyway. Uh, so, so I, I get, <clears throat> I get in my truck and, uh, and I've been cold. I've been in the rain all day long. I've been, it's, it's my longest trip. Now I just, I have an hour and a half to two hours to get back to the base and, and to get everything, sign out and, and get, I'm, I've just had this less trip. So I'm like, <sighs> so I get in the car, I turn on the Christian worship station, Christian music station. I, I turn the heat on, roll up the windows and I've, now, I've been wet, I've been tired all day long, wet, cold. Now this heat's hitting me, and the, and the, uh, and the music's playing. Boop, 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 boop. I don't know what was playing, but you know, it's it playing. And I'm just going, this is so good. <laughs> and next thing I know, I'm in the, I'm in the median of the going, burr, 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 burr. I'm like, what? And, uh, and it just got too warm in there. That, that, that warmth just added to me. I mean, just, I, I, I was out and, uh, I was, like, I was like, turn it on the rock and roll station, roll down every window, break the windshield. I don't care. I got to wake up, <laughs> but I, that's, that's kind of how I feel that verse is why that verse is there, that there's a lot of candles up going on up there in order to, to create enough light for them to be there. And so that added to the warmth. And so this kid, man, he, he's tired and it says, <clears throat> Probably didn't help my time at all right there, but that's okay. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. 
And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep. Now, the, the, the wording here kind of makes you feel like he was sleeping and then he got into like REM sleep. And, and, and really what it's saying there, the first part of it simply means that he fought sleep for a while. Kind of the picture in my head, and I, I shared this I think last week, is that, that he could feel it hitting him. It was warm, it was hot, and he thought, I need to go to the place that's probably the coolest place in the room to try to get myself awake. And so he walked over and sat in the window trying to fight the sleep. Because the breeze, any breeze that there was in that big that room with all these people in it would have been coming through that window. And so he's just he's he's trying everything he can. And that's what that word where it says he fell, uh, where it says fallen into a deep sleep. All that means is that he was he was he was fighting. Now none of us know that, and I know nobody in here has ever had to fight that ever before in their lives. Uh, and, and, but, but I think we can all relate to that. Larry's just sitting there going, I got to do something. And so he got up and he moved to the window. Now he's sitting in the window and, and it didn't help. It didn't help. And, um, and all of a sudden he sunk down with sleep. In other words, he went out and went, Burp, and he fell backwards down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him, and said, Trouble not yourself. Look to the, to the uh, certain uh, translations said, you know, quit whining. Quit, quit wailing about this stuff. Quit, quit it. Quit it. And again, the, the point that we brought out last week and, and what we need to grab on this is that, first of all, the early church loved the word. I mean, literally, he had preached. Most people believe that it was at least six hours that he'd preached up to that point. And about midnight, this kid, this teenager, finally fell asleep. And then when they went down there, wouldn't everybody think, you know what? If they're falling out of the windows, we probably need to go ahead and call tonight and go home. But they all went back upstairs and he preached until daybreak. I, I, I could have just read that, I suppose. Um, and, and therefore was come up again. For his life was in him. For his to come up again, they went and broke bread and, and eaten, talked a long while, even until the break of day. And then he departed. And they brought the young men alive, and they, they were not, or they were immensely comforted and, and overjoyed. So that first thing is, is just the, the love of the word. And I know, I know, I think there's a level where you guys pick on me, and there's a level, because you know me, and there's a level I pick on you. When we're like, you know, we're going to be for long one here tonight. And, and it's like, no, I'm leaving at five. I don't care. Who, I'm, I'm leaving at, uh, I'm leaving at 830, whether you're done or not, man. And, and, and I, I think some of that is joking around. Um, I, I, I live by the mentality that there's a fine line between uh, a long sermon and a hostage situation, because a, a lot of us in this room, uh, you wouldn't want pastor, you know, especially if you're the last ones. Everybody else has left, and you're sitting there going, "If I leave, he'll be preaching to nobody." Uh, um, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, so I think there's a level of that. But see, my question has got to be, and, and, and I'm, I, I don't want to get out of line here, so I'm going to just say this: is that look at the hunger that early ch church had for the Word of God. That six hours wasn't enough. And yeah, I understand. I get the point that. Uh, that, that he was probably leaving Tro uh, Troas and not coming back. I get that. But what a hunger. That, that, that apparently at the end of the night, he had preached for over 12 hours. Now, I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a second. But then the second thing that, I, that, that we saw there, the early church, and the thing that drove Paul was what we talked about last week where, where he, was, he, he took risks by a faith. He prepared himself in quiet and then took risks of faith in public. And it, and it seems to me like what happened with that boy is that, that the apostle Paul ran down and, and there was nothing, there, the boy was dead. Dr. Luke apparently had checked him out or at least knew what a dead kid looked like. And, and, and he was dead. And Paul jumped on top of the kid. It doesn't say that he went mouth to mouth with him like, like, like others had done. He just jumped on top of the kid and turned around and said, stop wailing. Stop crying. He's fine. Was he fine? We don't know. 
We don't know if it was a confession of faith. We don't know if he was just simply doing what Jesus did uh, to, to the little girl when he went to the home and, the, and there, all the mourners were there. And he said, why are you wailing? Why are you, why are you making such a big commotion? The girl's just sleeping. And she wasn't. She was dead as a doornail. But he was declaring what he he was declaring the author, under the authority that he had what was going on, and so th- there's it's a very real probability to me that this kid was dead. And Paul looked back and said, "Don't be wailing. He's just he's just chilling. He's just taking a nap. He's tired, you know." And 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 and, and that's what he believed. And as he spoke that, life came into that kid. And he came alive. And so, so it just, it's, it's striking me more and more that one of the things that's going to take us into the greater that we've got to grab a hold of, that the early church seems to have a, have a hold of, but we've got to in quiet, hear from God, plead with God, speak with God, talk with God, and in the public, take risks. Lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. Speak to tropical storms and watch them <clears throat> The thing that caused the tropical storm that was supposed to be over uh, uh, where we were at, the thing that caused it is that somewhere in the evening of that Friday night, a, a, a what was called a dry system? A, a dry system started just pushing it out of the way. Well, you know who sent the dry system? Is either God or my angels. But, I, but I, I spoke. I said, move it through. And so the dry system shoved it out of the way. <clears throat> We've got to take risks, laying hands, speaking to storms. Uh, mind your own business, Pastor. That okay? I'll mind my own business. Um, you are my business. Sowing seed, giving. I don't. I don't. If I give, I won't have it. <clears throat> Pastor Thad, haven't you heard that that inflation is the highest ever? Gas prices are the highest ever. I know. And can you imagine facing? Can you imagine facing those gas prices under the curse? I don't want to be under the curse. I want to be under the blessing. So I'm going to bring my tithe into the storehouse. Take risks. Jesus says, when it comes to your tithe, go ahead and take a risk. Prove me now here here with, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Not, Not enough. I couldn't imagine having to try to pay gas prices that are going under the curse. And I couldn't imagine having to depend on this world system for increase right now. It's gone, it's gone bonkers. So I want to be involved <coughs> and take risks in my seed time. Because if the word's true, then seed time and harvest is the way of the kingdom of God. And we, need to, and we need to commit ourselves to operating in that. Take risks. Now, as I was getting ready to move on, so, so that was that second point that we brought out. If we're going to step into the grave, we've got to take risks. But as I was getting ready to move on, I just wrote down this simple phrase. And it was amazing what the Holy Spirit did with this simple phrase. So I said, the final point, and to wrap up the story of Eutychus, is don't sleep in church. (laughs) You'll fall out a window and you'll die if you fall asleep in church. Well, uh, obviously that's not the main point of the story. There, there's, there's, There was commentators I read that made that the main part of the story. That God was showing us that we shouldn't fall asleep in church. I was like... I, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Um, obviously, it's also not um, permission for pastors to preach six hours. So, yeah. I was going to say, that if that one doesn't receive an amen, some of you guys were being really good with that. But when I, I look through this one more time, and again, that's kind of what I do. I just listen to the Holy Spirit. To, what do you have for us tonight? And when, it, when you read the descriptions, it says here that Paul preached unto them. And that preach is just discussion. It's not a spitfire. It's not um, he sweated. He's probably sweating. 
Uh, but it wasn't like this <clears throat> energetic spitfire, <laughs> you know, hacking. It, that's not what it was. He just talked to him. Matter of fact, the next word in that same verse for it is speech. While he gave a speech, it's legitimately all it is. His speech lasted until midnight. Uh, it is legitimately only presenting the fact that he sat in a chair and talked to them about the kingdom of God. That's all he did. There is nothing in this first verse here, verse 7. There is nothing there that even paints the picture that he was laying hands on the sick. I heard one person that says, well, when, when, when the church starts getting preaching like the apostle Paul had in there again, people will stay for six hours and 12 hours to hear it preach. And, and that's kind of the point I want to bring out here is that it doesn't seem like the apostle Paul was spit firing anything. The description of what Paul was doing had nothing to do with screaming, spitting, and entertaining. Well, I would go to church, but my pastor just, he just preaches for an hour and he doesn't do anything. He just kind of stands up there. I, I've had people go, so what do you do in your preaching? Do you get, do you have audience participation? I'm like, that's not my job. <laughs> audience participation is after the service when you take the word and go home. <laughs> and, 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 and th there's none of that here. Now, he may have over the course of six hours, because it does, it does say he broke bread with them. So it, it could have been a matter of them sitting around the table and maybe am asking questions or something on that order. But they were all there to hear him preach, teach, declare what the Word of God says. Matter of fact, one of those two words there, I believe, is the word logos. I think it might be the speech uh, word. So, so he was just delivered. He wasn't. He wasn't. And again, I just I get this feeling of of of, of you know, you know when I get preach, preachified a little bit, and I get a little excited, and I'm like, and 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 that that's <clears throat> he wasn't doing that. He was just legitimately just teaching them the word of God, teaching them the kingdom of God, and and and. Again, what he was doing there had nothing, and, and I, stick with me here, it had nothing to do with miracles. There's nothing said that he, was, that, that, that he was laying hands on the sick during that six hour period of time. All he was doing was teaching the word. He taught, he sat and taught for six hours. And see, we're living in a culture where pastors and churches are trying to reinvent themselves and have moved to a short, illustrated, entertaining sermon. Now, I'm going to pause there for a second. There's nothing wrong with illustrations. Jesus used illustrations. But... But, but we are living in a culture that literally we feel like we have to entertain people in order for them to stay in our church and hear the word. And what I'm getting here is six hours he didn't entertain. He didn't, he didn't, it's, it, maybe he had a cup of water there and he was showing certain things with a cup of water or whatever. And that, and that's fine. I, I, I do, I do illustrations all the time to give you pictures. But we live in a culture that if your pastor doesn't have short, illustrated, entertaining sermons, we're going somewhere else. Over 20 minutes, they're long-winded. Over a half hour, I don't know about that. Beloved, that... I, they're going to come to your church. You better meet those requirements. I want you to understand that. That is not building a strong body of believers. Just entertained ones. Teaching the word is the key to being strong, mature, greater works, Christians. Having the word taught to you. 
being hungry for the word. Go over to 1 Corinthians. Now again, I, I was this was not my anticipation. I, I, I thought I would get at least get us to Miletus, and I, hopefully we'll get to Miletus and get ready for the pastors' conference next week. Um, but, but I just this just flowed. And I want you to notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter three, verse one. It says, "And I, brethren, and the, the wording of the the, the two." Uh, portions of scripture that I'm going to read here are really interesting to me because he doesn't say I chose not to he said I could not speak to you as spiritual I couldn't it wasn't possible for me to deliver to you what I want to deliver to you see that got my attention because it you know a lot of people want to blame the pastors and I'm not saying pastors can't pre- preach flops of sermons, okay? I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that every pastor. But, but I'm telling you what, if we had more people who were ready, and I say we as in the body of believers, if, if there were more people ready to receive and were spiritual, he said, I, cu- I couldn't. He said, I came to you and I couldn't teach you as spiritual. I, and, and again, My focus here is that word, I could not. It didn't mean that he decided not to. It didn't mean that he he just, that that he wanted to entertain them. He said, matter of fact, the picture is, is I tried and it wasn't going anywhere. But he said, I could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as to carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now that's, that's two different points there. First of all, I, he preached to them not in the spiritual sense, but, but in, the, in, the, in the carnal sense or in the fleshly sense. In other words, they, had, they, weren't even, they weren't even born again. And if they were born again, they, weren't, they couldn't receive things in their spirit. They could only receive things a way that a carnal man would receive things, a carnal mind would receive. Romans chapter 8 tells us a carnal mind is at enmity with God, is at war with God. So that kind of gives you the feeling of what he's saying here is that is that you weren't receiving because, because what I was where I wanted to go, you were you were pushing off. I've been there in my ministry. I've been there where I've preached things, and, and I could feel it just legitimately hitting and falling to the ground. <laughs> and I was like, this ain't going nowhere. I've got a whole lot more to preach, and this ain't going nowhere. And, you, you know, you push through because you want to finish that thought, finish that concept. But, but, but some of them were not even able to receive it as born-again Christian. Boy, if that, doesn't, if that doesn't give you a picture of what's going on in the church world today, is that the only way they can see it is they get this they just have this, they're entertained and, they, and they're receiving like the world. Half hour, 20 minute sitcom. I can receive it. But then he says, even as unto babes in Christ. And that, that, that paints a little bit different picture. That they're Christians. It's just that they're still... They're, they're still, I mean, we're going to read uh, Hebrews in a little bit where it says you should be preaching and you're still getting fed the milk. They're not taking in the big stuff. They're satisfied with the fact that they were born. Both, you know, every one of our kids that have been born into this church, um, it, it, they, they didn't get satisfied with mama's milk. Mama's milk was wonderful. Mama's milk sustained them. Mama's milk, but but see, they weren't like, no, no, I don't want to try, you know, peas or carrots or whatever. I don't want to try uh, that stuff. I want to just, I just want mama's milk for the rest of my life. That it, it will not sustain you for the rest of your life. And so he says here that I could not come at you in the way that is going to build you up to do the greater things. I had to come at you in a carnal way. I think that's why a lot of times 
what's identified in what Paul preached was logos because he was just word upon word, giving them something that they could, they could bite off. Or I come at you in the fact that you're babies and I've got to give you easy stuff. He said, I felt you, I, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Now, again, we go back to what, what I, I shared there is that, that there was such a hunger in, in that early church in Troas where they were sitting there and they were receiving the meat of the word for six hours, this, 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 this heavy stuff. And it was going, listen, it had, they had to do that because from this point on, it was up to them. They were going to walk in, they're either going to walk in or not walk in the power of God. And it was up to them. And, 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 and they were not going to walk, they were not going to do the things that Paul did in their city if, the, if all they did was sit there and, and, and sip on the milk. But, he's, but notice this in verse 2. He said, I've fed, fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. And neither yet are you now ready to, ta to take it in. I want us to get that picture, the beloved. Um, <laughs> are you a person that pulls revelation from your pastor? Are you a person that, uh, I don't know, maybe you remembered what he preached. Or maybe you just remember the funny part. The part where he mispronounced the word or he told a joke or he gave an illustration. My point is, why did he give that illustration? Do you have that insight? Do you have that revelation? Do you know what he's trying to say? But he said, man, and, and again, I have it highlighted here. You weren't able to bear it. You weren't able to take what I was, what, what I was wanting to preach. It would have burned you out and it would have taken you out. They were not able to hand or, handle hearing the meat, teaching of the word. He had to, maybe he had to go shorter, easier. They were looking for, and again, I'm going to add this part in there, but they were looking for entertaining messages, fun stuff. A lot of times people try to play, uh, blame the pastors, which again, I'm not saying is right or wrong, but a lot of times the main problem is in the pews. If you give them meat, they would choke on it and they wouldn't want any more. The, uh, Kenneth Copeland talks about when he first started and got the revelation of, of prosperity, seed time and harvest back in the 60s, I think it was. And when, when, he got that, when he got that insight, he started teaching it right away because he was so excited about it. And, and, uh, and Christians and churches just started shutting him down, getting angry with him. And the Holy Spirit said, listen, I know you work it. But don't preach it right now. They're not. You're, you're, you're hurting the body of Christ right now. Not because it's wrong. They're just not able to receive it at this time. Listen, what we're going to go into starting next week is we're going to start talking about uh, pastors and the Apostle Paul speaking to the pastors. Some of my favorite scriptures are found in, in, in his ministry to the pastors of Ephesus. But the thing that the word of God tells us time and time again is that I'm held responsible for what I preach to you. And that's why there's sometimes, there's sometimes, I, I, there was a couple years ago, I started a series. And it was going over like a lead balloon. And I was, I knew it, I knew I needed it, I knew I wanted it, I knew, I knew it was what God was showing me. And, and, and I, I could just see everything like, and, and, and the Holy Spirit said, this is your last sermon on this for a while. About two years later, I'm preaching a series covering the same thing, drawing, just bringing us to a more of a commitment in, in areas. And the reception of it was like, yeah, that's what we need. That was what we need. 
At one point, they, you, weren't able, you weren't able to bear it. And then what changed? I don't know what changed. But we've got to, I am held responsible for what I preach to you. And so guess what? If you don't like me teaching on the tithe, I'm going to teach on the tithe. You don't like me teaching on seed time and harvest, I'm going to teach on seed time and harvest. You don't like me teaching on, I don't know, uh, hardships? Well, ain't no hardships in the kingdom of God. Then you're in the wrong kingdom, bro. The enemy does not attack that which he does not fear. Did I say that right? He does not attack what he does not fear. And so as long as you're someone <clears throat> that, that causes the enemy a little bit of um, discomfort in his backside, he's going to come at you. All right, I, let, me, let me finish this point. I gotta, can't preach all night. I'm excited about Sunday. I don't know what I'm preaching yet, but I, no, I, I, I know where I'm going and I know the gist of everything and it's, it's something I've never really taught like this before, but it's, it's good. Anyway, um, it says, for ye are yet carnal, verse three, for where, where is there is, now notice this. How do we know when we're maturing and ready for meat? As long as there's envying, strife, and divisions, it's how you love others. It's how you deal with others on, on, your, on, on whether or not you, you're, you're maturing. The most selfish people in the world are babies. I love babies. I was one. I've had, I've, I've had two. And let me tell you this. When they were on milk, they were selfish. It doesn't matter what mama's doing. Mama could be on a phone call, an important phone call. But if I'm hungry, mama, you better feed me now. And see, that's the that's what it's saying here is that when, when you're when you're in that place and you're and you're you're me first and my schedule my I can't do this I I I've got to do that matter of fact I got I'm going to keep moving because there's it feeds on this in a second and and that becomes your mentality um, you know you're not ready you're not ready for the greater don't fool yourself beloved. Don't think that you're ready for the great. I'd love to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I want to sing in front of thousands of people and see them just come to know the Lord and all that kind of stuff. You ain't ready if you're still just trying to figure out um, the tithe or you're just trying to figure out whether I go to church or not or you're trying to figure out. You're not ready for the greater. Don't fool yourself. The greater comes to those that are set, their minds are set on the things of God and only the things of God. Go over to Hebrews chapter 5. I told you I was not looking at the, for this. I just this kind of just came and developed, and um, I was hoping I could get us down to Miletus, but we'll start that next week. Um, it means I have to practice all the names again. Um, but Hebrews chapter five verse eleven, it says, "Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, being your dole of hearing." <laughs> you, you, you want a real, a real eye opener? That word dull right there is the word that means stupid or lazy. Here's the picture I get from this. I want to teach you a lot of stuff. And I'm not able to teach you a lot of stuff. Because you are too lazy in the things of God to receive it. Now, that's what he said. I'm not saying that to you guys. I want you to understand that. But there might be some people that could relate to this and go, 
I don't want to sit here an hour and hear him preach. I've got things to do. I want, I'm not lazy. Are you lazy with the word? That's what, but again, he says the same thing. I want to do it, but it's hard to be uttered seeing that you're dull of hearing. For, for when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you're still needing someone to teach you. Again, so, so teachers get to the point where they never need, no, no, no. Uh, ye have need that one teaches you again, which be the first principles of the oracles. I want somebody teaching me. That's one of the reasons why I love listening to Bill Johnson. It's because he challenges me. I don't, you cannot listen to him just passively. You have to sit down and listen to him. And I love listening to him. Matter of fact, he went to the, the, the Southwest Believers Conference. He preached there uh, a couple years ago. And it was funny because they, had, they were broadcasting on the Victory Channel. You remember seeing him on it back then? Because I, they, they broadcast on the Victory Channel. And, they, and, and after every one, they would do kind of like what they... Remember the beauty pageants where they'd move away and th- two people would be up there talking with the stage behind them? they go, hey. This is a... And that's kind of what they would do. The Gene, Pastor Gene, I guess is what they call him. He'd be up there and they would run down what... Now again, I'm not picking on him. I'm not picking on him. But when, but at, when, they, when they got to the end of... Bill Johnson's, they went, well, I don't even know how to run that one down. That was good, but that was, yeah. And, and they were just, they were just dumbfounded by what he said because it was so deep and so much and so, and, 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 and it was not passive. And, and I just, I, again, I, I was sitting there going, this is what he said. Did you not listen? Um, but he said, you still are having to do the first stuff. The beginner stuff. And are become such as that need milk and not meat. And then it says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason have used their senses and exercised good. Now, just simply saying, your meat will be developed based on your age or your your ability to receive it. Uh, Lorelei can't eat as much meat as Reese. Reese can't eat as much meat as his grandpa. It all develops as you have, as you develop. Your age, your, your development determines that. On, on how much meat you are. But the, mo- but the more meat you eat, the stronger you get. Yeah. Beloved, we must watch out not to fall into the habits of our culture. To grow in the thing, but, but, but to grow in the things of God. You're, it, it, let me say this. I, I, I see. In order to grow in the things of God, you're going to have to go contrary to culture. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Uh, yes, there are some things we can redefine. We can redevelop. We can we can do this a little bit different. That little, but when it comes to the word, I will uh, the, I will never make a change. I want us to be strong, and again, I want us to be to, to develop. But when but when when the culture goes one way, we've got to go against the flow. When the culture is loud, which it is, we need to learn to be quiet and listen. Not, not, not to say stuff. Pastor Lisa said, shut the door. Quit listening to the, quit listening to the noise. We need to learn to quiet down and hear the voice of the spirit. One of the next statements we, we get in here as, as, as the apostle Paul leaves Tro- Troas is that the, everybody gets on the ship and they're getting ready to, to sail down to ask Asos. And, and he goes, you guys go on, I'm walking. And you say, he just didn't need the exercise. No, he just needed to be away from the noise. It just needed to be him. He needed to talk with, a, with God and hear the spirit of God and get direction of where to go. Culture's opinionated. 
We must learn not to lean on our understanding, but in all, all of our ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct our paths. Did you catch that? Culture of men loves their own opinions. We've got to learn to lean not on our own understanding. Culture is selfish. We must walk in the love for God and for others. Culture is rush, rush, rush. We must learn to slow down and take time at the table and dine. And I'm knocking. Will you slow down enough to come and answer the door and dine with me? Culture wants to be entertained. We must learn to be fed. I believe the biggest point in the story of Eutychus is how hungry are you for true meat? You just want fast food? You just want satisfying sweets? How hungry are you for the word, for the true meat? What the church needs now. When I typed that out, I could hear, what the church needs now is love. uh, We need the hunger for the word. We need to be people that yank it and pull it out of our pastors. That we want that next point of revelation. We want that next point of insight. Do you guys understand? I'm not picking on you. I'm talking about the church. If, if you're the person that's saying, is it me? It might be. It might be. I, I don't know. That, that's for you to figure out. But we need to become more hungry for the word. Never get to that place that we've arrived and that, and that we know everything. Because we will never grow into the fullness of what God's called us to if we don't. If, if we don't receive the word, be hungry for the word. And again, and again well, we went to church Sunday and Wednesday and we got, we got a lot of word. I know. And I ate yesterday too. I ate, mon- I ate Monday. You know what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to eat. So as much as you think you need to feed your, your, your natural body, You better be feeding your spirit the meat of the word. Amen. When you take the time to feed on him, you can expect the supernatural. And when you fall out a window of the third story, you better hope there's someone there is filled with the word and filled with power. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll get, we'll get, again, I wasn't even looking for that. I just, I just wrote one phrase down and all of a sudden I started jotting. I was like, Lord, you're funny. Amen. Are you hungry? Stay hungry. You say, I'm not really that hungry, Pastor. I I'm not that hungry for the word. Your problem is you're not eating enough. Eat more. There's been times where I'm like, I got so much to do. I don't have time to listen to a sermon. And then I listen to the sermon. I'm like, I need a second sermon. Let's stand together. Lord, I'm hungry for a mighty move of God. Lord, I'm thirsty Pour out your Holy Ghost. Lord, I want to see the hand of God move mightily inside of me. Lord, I'm hungry for a mighty move of God. Lord, I'm hungry. For a mighty move of God, Lord, I'm thirsty, pour out your Holy Ghost. Lord, I want to see the hand of God move mightily inside of me. 
Lord, I'm hungry for the mighty move of God. Heavenly Father, that's our passion. Is that I don't want to read about the greater. I don't want to hear about the greater. I want to walk in the greater. And the only way I can, I can, we can do that as a body of believers is for our hunger for the things of God, our hunger for the word of God to increase and to develop into this ravenous beast (laughs) of of gobbling down every bit of word that we can so that we can be deliverers of that word. We can go and we can take on the enemy. We're try- people are trying to take on the enemy weak and, and fragile. There's not one of us that would send our, <clears throat> our, our toddler out ahead if, if, if there was danger. Uh, we, we got some bear in our front yard. And so we put, hey, hey, here, AJ, here, run out there and save the family. No, man, because he doesn't have the strength to do that. And I'm not saying dad has the strength to do that, but dad has much more ability to take care of the danger because he's stronger. And here we are as the body of Christ trying to, uh, thinking that we're going to defeat the devil by being wimps and by being weak. And and it's just not going to work. We must arm ourselves. We must load ourselves with the word of God, strengthening ourselves. Hallelujah. So we can be the men and women of God that you created us to be. Hallelujah. Jesus name. T- Taylor, you're, you're familiar with this stuff. How many calories does like the big, huge bodybuilders take in a day? Roughly. I mean, you don't have to be. 5,000. Those men, those men that, those the strongest men in the world that are picking up boulders, those probably, they're probably five to ten thousand. What? Maybe fifteen thousand. If any of us do that, but if you're going to be the strong, like you need to be strong, you need to eat an abnormal amount. Amen. So, amen. I don't not, I'm not talking about hamburgers. I'm talking about the word. Amen. Keep feeding. Get as much as you can. And but I'm going to tell you what. It'll, it'll be impossible for you not to walk in the greater amen. the more word you get in you. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, amen. Amen. Not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, now Sunday, I don't know. I make no promises on Sunday, uh, but but come on, man, just get, come bring some friends. We are in for the most exciting period of time in the history of our church, and man, we just hallelujah. If if you're not excited, let me get get a candle and stick it on your backside, and we'll see if we can get you moving. Just kidding. I love you guys. Go with God. Walk in his blessings. Prosper, be in health, even if your soul prospers. I love you. God bless. Go with God. Amen.